Hello, my name is Hazel Beck. I was born Hazel Emeretta Hunt on May 19th, 1894 in Cairo, Michigan, the only child of Aylmer L. Hunt and Eliza R. Klinger Hunt. When I was young, we moved south to the big city of Detroit, where my father was his traveling salesman. He became a grocer when that job didn't pan out. When I was nine, he started getting sick. His stomach hurt a lot, and the doctors tried to tell him that it was just ulcers. But when I was 10, he died of stomach cancer. We took his body back to Carroll for burial, because that's where Grandma and Grandpa Hunt lived. After that, Mother took us down to Ohio, just across the Michigan state line. There she met and married another man named Hunt, Herbert H., who was no relation to Father, by the way. Uh, He was a baker from Ontario, Canada, and he liked to be called Bert. I think Mother liked the idea of not having to change her name again. Soon afterwards, we moved out west. We bought a house in the town of Kelso at 601 South 3rd Street. I started school there, but I didn't really enjoy the long walk up the hill to the schoolhouse, especially during the winters when the streets were so muddy. At least I made some good friends. Some of the things I remember about that time were my first smelt run and when the bridge to Catlin washed out. It was January 1906 when I saw my first smelt run. My friends told me all about it, but it was hard to believe, so they walked me over to the railroad depot to watch. Looking out over the Cowlitz River, underwater, I could see a large writhing mass snaking its way upriver and above dozens of small boats, each with one or two men in them dipping their long-handled nets into the mass. In smooth, practiced motions, the men pulled up a net of small, shiny little fish, dumping them out at the bottom of the boat, then plunged right in for more. At the docks, just upriver of us, several boats that were already full were tied up to have their catch boxed up for shipping. Each boat must have had about several hundred pounds in it. Uh, Already the boxes were piling up at the depot, waiting to be shipped by train. It was quite the spectacle for a girl who had only seen Great Lakes fishermen ply their trade before. It was November of that year, 1906, when a large storm and high water washed out the bridge over to Catlin. The bridge was only two years old, a wooden and cable bridge with a draw span to allow the stern wheelers to pass. It was a private toll bridge, but it was quicker and easier than waiting for a ferry to cross the river. The same storm caused a lot more damage upriver, but the bridge was the big loss for Kelso. The owners rebuilt the bridge the next year, and it was a bit sturdier. As I started making friends, so did my stepfather, Bert. In 1909, he and some of his friends decided to try their hand at farming down in Southern Oregon in Douglas County. So our family with Amos Buker, Charlie Brack, and Oliver Knowles left Kelso together and bought farms near each other on the South Umpqua River near the village of Purdue, just Southeast of Roseburg. By then I'd had enough of schooling and didn't bother attending the small rural school at Purdue. Instead, I settled into helping out my parents on their new farm. Other than our neighbors, we occasionally had the company of travelers along the river road. That was how I met my first husband. Claude H. Short was a handsome enough young man, only a few years older than me. His family lived in Roseburg, but he would bought a farm in the hills farther up the South Umpqua between the villages of Tiller and Drew. Our courtship went well, and after I turned 18, we were married in November of 1912. I moved to his mountain ranch with him. Eleven months later, thankfully in Roseburg with a doctor present, I gave birth to our daughter, Mabel Bernice Short. Life was hard on the ranch, especially with a small child. Claude didn't make it any easier. It seemed like he was always yelling at me all the time. Instead of hiring help, he made me do a lot of the hard labor on the ranch. Things didn't get any easier when, in 1914, my parents gave up their farm and moved back to Kelso. After that, my only solace seemed to be spending time with Claude's mother and sister in Roseburg. By 1917, Claude and I had grown to hate each other. He left in September, so I sued for divorce and custody of our daughter. He was no fit parent. A Douglas court was swift to grant both conditions. Bernice and I caught the next train north for Kelso to live with my parents. 
It was nice to see old friends again. It was also nice to see how the town had improved in the eight years I'd been gone. I'd heard there was some stigma of being a divorced woman, but I didn't experience it. So I was so glad to be rid of Claw that I did not care. I made myself useful by helping out in Bert's bakery. A few months later, I met a sweet older man who became sweet on me. His name was William Beck, and he was a watchmaker who had a jewelry shop in town. He was born in Pennsylvania, but had been in Cowlitz County for 25 years since the family had come west to work at the Collins logging operation at Ostrander. Even though he was nearly 20 years older than me, his kindly disposition matched my own, and he was ready to settle down and raise a family. It didn't hurt that my parents liked him, too. We were married in Vancouver on June 16th, 1918, and after a short honeymoon up in Seattle, we rented a house at 303 Cowlitz Way. Helping him out in his watch shop was much nicer than being in the bakery. Not nearly as hot, and the hours were much better. We had lots of fun together, despite the restrictions put on us by the Great War. In October, a nasty new form of influenza arrived in the town. Some people got sick, but... A few people died. Even though public meetings were closed down and we had to wear masks, it didn't seem so bad. We tried to carry on with business as usual. We celebrated with the rest of the town when the armistice was signed in November. The flu was getting worse in December, and most families had at least one or two people sick at home over the winter. The Christmas season was busy at the shop, and I think that's how I caught it. It was the day after Christmas that it started to hit me. The fever and chills, the horrible achiness, oh, it was dreadful. After the first day, I was stuck in bed. A few days later, it turned into pneumonia. I heard the church bells ringing in the new year, but our family had nothing to celebrate. I died about 10.30 in the morning on January 4th, 1919. A small private funeral was held at my parents' house three days later, mostly because of the ban on public gatherings. Out of respect for me, all of the businesses in Kelso closed during my funeral. Afterwards, my body was sent to Portland for cremation. William was so heartbroken that he could barely carry on. He couldn't even look at my daughter without being reminded of his grief. My parents ended up raising her. William ended up losing his jewelry business and turned to odd jobs until he took up farming in Hazeldell. We were finally rejoined in 1962.